Hello and um, welcome to a uh, spicy chess and hopefully it's going to be spicy. Now, um, as always, uh, Charlie the Ginger Cat or Charlie the Chess Cat, who's sitting down here, his timing is impeccable. Uh, 30 seconds before I went to go live, he, he jumped onto the desk. You might hear him if you hear that purring, it, it is actually a cat. And um, he's now trying to bite my hand or play with my hand, aren't you, Charlie? So it's going to be an interesting start to the show today. Um, and that's why I've got the mouse over here, so I don't get in the way of his uh, his uh, his hands. Um, anyway, it's going to be a lot of fun today. Um, I apologise for any nude ginger bottoms you may see on the broadcast. I know this is a, a family show, but uh, these things occasionally happen, you know, and uh, sue me. Um, so, um, yeah, so what are we going to do today? Well, basically, uh, a couple of things. I've got, um, I want you guys to get involved. I'll be following um, the chat over on Twitch and also chess.com TV. So I'll try to uh, keep an eye on what you guys are, are saying. Um, or maybe I'll get my, my helper to do that. And um, <laughs> I've got a great game lined up for you that I, I want to show you first of all. I've also got a puzzle or two, which I thought could be quite fun. And then given a chance, I'm going to try playing a, a longer play game where I explain my thoughts. So you can get the, um, basically, you can try to dive into my thoughts and dive into the mind of a grandmaster. That's uh, the idea. Anyway, I, I see people are are getting a little bit worried about the prospects of uh, a ginger bum on the screen i will say that it will only be charlie's ginger bum if if it's, it's not going to be my ginger bum don't worry um okay right well uh, what i'm going to show you now let's just kick off with an amazing game and this is one of the most amazing chess games ever so I would say go and get yourself some popcorn or, or whatever you fancy and just sit back and enjoy. And I've got some questions I'm going to ask you during the course of this game, just so you guys can see, uh, you know, try to try to get involved a bit as well. Now, um, I'm sure everyone listening to this show is aware of Vichy Van Anand, ex-world champion, um, a great player, obviously, brilliant player. And um, Vishwan Anand, um, when asked what his favourite game of all time was, and there's a lot of games to pick from, aren't they? You can pick from the old games such as Morphe from New Orleans or maybe some of the newer games. Maybe you like Magnus Carlsen Grind. But he picked the game I'm about to show you here. And this is a game between Danny Gormali, who's a good friend of mine, Grandmaster. He had the white pieces. And a guy called Satoski with the black pieces. Now let me flip the board. We're going to see it from Satoski's point of view. And this is this is one of the best games, one of the most amazing tactical games ever played. Now I think to help us out as we go through this game, some things to bear in mind are um, well, really, I think this is all about something that's so important to chess which so many people forget about and not something i've talked about a lot in the past obviously to become a good chess player you have to improve many different areas now one of the areas that is key to chess and to life is timing 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 and tempo tempo and timing and what i mean by that is is basically you need to um it makes sure you do the right things in the right position. You need to time your moves well and you need to judge what is going on in a particular position. You need to work out whether you have time to play a long maneuver, a positional idea where you maybe move a piece, the same piece, five moves in a row, or whether you have time to do something. You have to do something a bit quicker. I mean, for example, um, let's say you were having dinner in your house and suddenly a fire broke out you probably wouldn't want to finish your dinner. You wouldn't want to go, oh, yes, very nice, very nice, yes, lovely, and your face is burning off. You'd probably want to get out of the room, get out of the house. In the chess position, I see so many players who don't adapt to the change in pace in the game. That's one thing I want you to um, bear in mind when looking at this and try to learn from, the change in pace. If something changes in a game, you have to change as well. You have to adapt. If, if it's getting more tactical, you have to get more tactical. You have to get more brave. 
and um it's really these critical moments which are so so important so let's let's have a look at the game anyway so okay okay now um black played the sicilian one of the most interesting and also i would say best ways of meeting e4 if you want to counter attack in opening the sicilian you can't go far wrong with a sicilian and now we had what is called the open sicilian and that is where white plays d4 and this is the main line sicilian and black captured went here and now played a6 and again there's a number of variations in this position that black can play as i'm sure you're all aware of uh you can play the dragon you can play the classical with knight c6 this is the dragon this is the classical this is the something another <laughs> but the the move that is most popular and has been i would say for i don't know how many years this has been most popular well since going back to at least fisher's day so at least the 70s um you know maybe a bit before that the 60s so i would say 60 years this move a6 has probably been one of the best ways in the sicilian it stood up to the test of time and it's a very good way of playing against one e4 but there is a quite a lot to learn so that that's why like for example i don't play this um um basically opening too much because there's so much to learn and I, I don't have time to learn all the theory and that's another thing you've got to remember you've got to pick an opening that suits your time if you've got four hours a day to look at chess lucky you then you might want to play this opening if you've if you've only got 10 minutes a day you shouldn't play this opening let's move on though now white played bishop c4 this is a move that fisher used to play when facing the nydorf the bishop's very well placed here on the most aggressive square and now e6 blocks that bishop out for the time being and bishop b3 and this is a clever little move because the bishop on c4 was quite exposed to attack so when it moves back to b3 it steps out of the way it just gets out of the way of uh, um, a number of attacks and um ah oh, just seen in in the twitch chat we have aldo there uh, hello aldo and i should say hello to everyone else um had a very fun day the other day at battersea chess club if you're ever in london do go there uh, me and another simon did a talk with two simons and played a little bit of blitz afterwards um but okay let's let's move on with the game now b5 this is one of the reasons you play a6 it's to start your counter attack on the queen side and this is one of the main ideas of the sicilian to play whoa don't know what happened there some burp came out get the b5 in and now castles now a move i actually like playing if you want to play something super aggressive as white that's not too much theory and this is something i play occasionally i actually played it against international master richard bates the other day in the blitz event at battersea i play this move which is a really rare move but this is a super aggressive move because all you're doing is white imagine what white's doing white's literally putting every single piece on the most aggressive square he can think of now that can't be bad surely you put the bishop on g5 pinning you put the bishop on b3 and this bishop on b3 often sacrifices itself on e6 for example if knight d7 i would very 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 well, i wouldn't be able to resist that move i'd have to play bishop takes e6 which is a typical sacrifice pawn takes and then the knight dives in and you, you get loads of good action um so uh, yeah this is this is kind of the move i like playing but again this is uh quite sharp not everyone likes it castle's king side is the way fisher played and after bishop e7 well fisher used to now play f4 this was fisher's idea and another thing you should all do when you're playing is every move you play has to have a reason loads of people when i was teach when i used to teach i don't anymore i would say why did you play that move and they would say oh you know i read it somewhere or um the computer told me it was the best move and then i'd say why did you play that move and they'd say the computer told me and then i'd say why did you play that move and this would go on for about five minutes until they actually came up with a reason verbally why that's a good move um it's not because the computer tells you i mean like you know most most facts in life i suppose are actually other people's facts that no one's thought about themselves 
And F4, if we think about it ourselves, what's the point of this? Well, the point is to try to go F5 next move. Oh, and then this bishop becomes a lot more open. You're either going to attack E6, or if black's E pawn moves, because you force it to move, the bishop will then be attacking at F7, so it gains in power. So remember, always ask yourself why every move. So uh, instead, bishop E7 was played, queen F3, and... This is a standard move. Whenever your opponent plays a move, the first thing you should do is think, why did my opponent play that move and what's his idea? So if you were asleep here and you weren't doing that, you might castle here. And then after e5, which is clearly the idea behind this, you would get a pretty much lost position. So the normal way to meet queen f3 is queen c7. The Nyadorf, if you play this opening as black, you, you it's a very sharp opening it's very very sharp and i think it's a great opening for youngsters to play who have time to learn the best opening because if you play this opening as black you're forced to not defend passively you're forced to fight fire with fire what i mean by that is if white attacks you you can't just sit there and try to soak it up like you can in some other openings that doesn't work in the Nyadorf. what you have to do if your opponent comes at you you have to punch them back you have to dodge and punch and this is what queen c7 does now the idea is if you meet e5 you can go bishop b7 and this is the kind of a typical counter attacking idea in the Nyadorf. Um and it's very very common for this opening white now plays queen g3 he puts his queen on a more aggressive square and now black plays Knight c6, white takes on c6, and now white plays uh, a move where, which was following Nigel Short at the time, the theory. Now you might be thinking, why not queen takes g7? Well, this this is just a bad move. Black often tries to castle queenside in a knight off, and here, after rook g8, queen here, you've allowed this rook on the g-file, and black can immediately take on d5. Uh, getting a pawn back with the attack but i wouldn't be surprised if there's something much stronger as well you know so that would just be silly of white to do that why open up a line towards your king when black's king has not committed itself to to where it's going to be placed um remember if you don't have any questions do ask him i want to get to where it really heats up rookie one was played just defending this one and now bishop b7 and this has ideas of going b4 and taking here again counter-attacking rather than defending g7 developing counter-attacking white plays a3 to try to stop b4 and now black plays rook to d8 and again black's not worried about white taking on g7 this is more of a sacrifice but black figures with all the pieces lined up like this there should be uh, uh, some very good compensation here which has been proven in other games um now what danny played a4 pawn to a4 here is a move that nigel short played against um uh gary kasparov and this rook d8 move is a kasparov move now i see someone in the chat is asking why not rook to c8 well rook to c8 would have made some sense it's normally where you put the rook because it's on a half open line but rook to d8 has a much better purpose i mean again if you went rook to c8 i might ask you why why did you put the rook there and if your answer is i put it on a half open file i would say okay i'll give you half a point but what is your actual idea what are you going to do next okay you put your rook on a nice square but do you have a plan not necessarily if you put your rook on d8 you have a plan your plan is to support d5 and imagine if you get the pawn on e4 out of the way, and that's the idea of going d5, there's going to be some major problems with queen takes g2. So that is, that's, it's got a much better point to it. Um, and um, I'm sorry if this is a bit complicated, Dormia said, Deuce, um, it's going to get worse. <laughs> I'm trying to make it as simple as I can, but it, it's always uh, hard to bridge the gap. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep it, you know i'm trying to keep it simple but this is a blooming complicated game when i do it when i play a long play game later it will be easier to follow but you might as well test yourself eh um okay so um now black dig castle you've got a castle at some point and both sides are really now getting into the middle game now there's no point i said that this game was all about 
tempo and speed and adjusting to new situations. Now, in the opening, there's no point in the opening trying to do something too crazy. Most of the time that doesn't work. Sometimes you can, but if you really want to improve as as a chess player and get better and better, then it's it's basically a good idea to um, play the no opening normally. So get your pieces developed, get your king castle, get into the middle game and only in the middle game then get spicy. Um, because if you start doing crazy things without a good foundation, without any development, without a safe king, it will backfire. Uh, by the way, just to answer someone's question, someone as um, I see uh, Moody Abel is asking, why not B4? Well, maybe someone can answer that. First question, if Black played B4, which is a good idea, it's the first move you should be looking at. So you're on the right wavelength, uh, Moody Abel. What would White play here? So um, what would White play here uh, in this position? So what is a good move for White here? And it's a little bit annoying for Black, the next move. I mean, I don't know, maybe this is, maybe B4 is an idea, but the next move, there's two ideas I'm thinking of here, two ideas. I've got two ideas here. Um, I don't know which is the best idea, uh, but let's have your suggestions. So if you're watching this in the chat, I'm following the chat on chess.com slash TV and also on Twitch. So um, now there's two ideas here. Now, uh, normally in the Sicilian, when the rook is here lined up against the king, there's a very typical idea. And the typical idea is to play um, knight to d5. That's the first move I'd be thinking of. Now... I don't think queen takes... I think this is just a blunder. Someone recommended queen takes g7 because of rook g8. Isn't this just a blunder? And we looked at this, you're going to lose a piece. I don't like the look of this. This looks bad, unless I'm missing some amazing tactic. No, I'm not. I don't think I am. So the first move I'd be thinking of is can white sacrifice with this? But probably no one's actually found the first move I, I, that came to mind. Um, the first move that came to mind here is a four. This would be my first fault here. And this is now getting very complex because the bishop is threatening to come out to a four. So this is a normal idea because you want to, you see the little black pawn on uh, B4. You want to, you want to make basically keep that pawn really just so it can't be defended. You're stopping black from playing a five. You know, for example, if pawn takes knight, the idea of a4, a5, the tactical idea is to free up the a4 square. And here, bishop to a4 would win the queen. So I think that's really, uh, you know, maybe uh, the, the reason I, I, I would be a bit worried about playing that. And I think black did a very sensible thing. Black just castled. Sorry about the, the, the tap in the background there. Um, hopefully it you, you won't interfere with you. Um, and um, I see some people mention it, but okay. So a, a, a castles here is, is, is just a normal move. Again, why, you know, get your king safe before you think about tactics. And here, pawn takes a5, it's white's idea. Pawn takes a5, and now he plays bishop h6. There's a big threat against g7. Only one way to stop that, a good way. Knight to e8. And now white's idea is rook a7. Now, I personally think that white's idea here um, of putting a rook here and the bishop here is superficial. Again, this, this to me, uh, I'm not blaming Danny for doing it because it's, it's actually following an idea of Nigel Short. So we can blame Nigel for this, not Danny. Is when you're playing active looking moves they've really got to have a point to it and you've got to work out if you're just hitting at thin air or not and i think this rook is not really doing much the bishop not really doing much these two pieces to me they're not coordinating with each other they're on opposite sides of the board they're very easy threats to stop they're kind of like you're kind of like a boxer who's like boxing but he's not hitting anything you know he's hitting nothing so i think these i think black is already doing quite well here and Let's just move on to where it gets quite exciting. Black does decide anyway just to swap off this rook. Why not? Why not swap it off? And around here, I would say black is at least equal because black has more ideas. 
I mean, always think when you're playing this, we're looking at this from the black point of view. So when I'm playing the moves, try to think what you would do as black. What ideas are you trying to do? Well, what I'm trying, what I would do is a typical Sicilian idea. I would try to push B4. That would make the white knight go to a bad square. The white knight here is, is, is you know, needs to then move. You're pushing it back. And then later on, I would try to get my pieces in the game. And maybe I'd want to play D5 at some point. Because I want to basically swap my D pawn for the E pawn. If you could take both of those pawns off the board, then that would definitely help black. Why would that help black? Because look at the power of this diagonal then. You get rid of the blockader. In actual fact, this bishop is the winning piece in the game. Let's move on quickly. I want to get to the exciting bit. Now they shadow dance here a little bit. They do a little bit of dancing. Danny offers a draw with that little sequence. But... Now black says, no, I don't want to draw because my position's at least equal. And here, the change of tempo starts to happen. Now I'm going to say this is critical stage number one. Black plays B4 and he's changing the tempo because he's noticed that white hasn't got anything from the opening. White's threats have disappeared. So if you're black, you normally start off in a little bit of a, a negative footing but you try to take over control of the game. And if your opponent is not doing anything, and you can see that White's just moving his bishop backwards and forwards, you should have the alarm bells ringing. So if your opponent is clearly not doing anything, and you've, you've managed to stop him doing anything worrying, then you, the alarm bells should be ringing, and you should be thinking of going from a very slow walking pace, you know, development, castling, to shall we say a quick walk you should be then trying to find ways to put pressure on your opponent so if we're looking at tempo changing for me this b4 is a very good move um and okay after this the knight has to move so now the knight is badly placed and the next stage now let's keep that walk going let's pick up the pace is how can we now get our pieces into the game because in order to create threats we're going to need to get our pieces to the best squares so Let's have a look. Which pieces are bad? Well, I think the queen and bishop I've highlighted here are pretty good. They're on good squares. But the knight on e8, to me, has a very natural good square. Knight to f6 comes in. And this now puts pressure on e4 here. So I'm trying to look at the uh, questions as we, we go around. Um, oh, you're talking about flat earth theory. Um, well, that, that's that's nice to see. I, I don't know if I've got much to say on, on flat earth theory, except if you understand physics, then it probably can't be proven. Surely. I like the idea of it, but no, it can't be. Or no, hollow earth theory I'm thinking of. A bit of hollow earth theory. That, that That's something. I like the idea of there being some super race down in the, in, in, in the depths of uh, the earth, but I somehow doubt it. I like the idea. I think that's where gingers came from, the depths of the earth, you know, all, all, where all the intelligent grandmasters came from. Of course not. I don't claim that for a second. Um, okay, well, anyway, let's, let's move on. So bishop h6, and you can see white is clearly not, he's not, he hasn't got a plan. And again, if your opponent is drifting like this, it should raise you in confidence. Now, he could have um, maybe taken here, but then I have a couple of, well, let's say I, I'm, I'm black here. I have a couple of tempting moves. My queen is attacked, but if I just do something like queen to b7, I attack the knight and I attack the pawn. And if white defends that, knight takes e4, I have a lovely central majority. And it's normally a good, it's normally better to have more pawns in the center. That, that is generally going to give you an advantage. So, so far, I have to say, not much has happened. And you might be thinking, why is this game so beautiful? Well, just have a look at how the pace changes. Remember, Black is now walking at a brisk pace. He's picking up the, picking up the sort of, should I say, tempo. And now he moves to the next gear. I think now he starts jogging. Knight to h5. He's starting to create frets. And he's starting to try to get his pieces to the best squares. Whilst trying to keep his opponent's pieces, look at that knight on a2, to really bad squares. So he's created a threat. The queen moves, and now his queen comes and defends both of his targets. So he's now jogging, I would say. Black is jogging. And here, a big mistake by Danny. F3. Now, why is F3 a mistake? Because this is the kind of thing you need to be thinking of when you're playing. If your opponent plays a move, 
if you think it's a mistake, well, you sometimes have got to realise when your opponent plays a mistake, even if it's a positional mistake, because the only way you're going to take advantage of something is to realise it's a mistake. Danny is a very good grandmaster, and here he played f3. Now, why is that a mistake? Now, I don't even necessarily want any tactical justification. Remember, what I'm trying to get you to do is thinking wise, you know, verbally wise. So verbally, give me an explanation why that's a mistake. Have a think about it. Why is f3 a mistake? Um, and tra uh, Trav Kusken, completely correct. Very simple, very simple explanation. Um, well, well done from Trav Kushkin. And really, this is a mistake because you open up all of these dark squares towards your king. Every pawn move in chess makes a weakness. That might sound crazy, but every time you move a pawn, you weaken a square. And by moving uh, this pawn to f3, you weaken not just a square, but a whole diagonal. And you have to be very careful about doing that. So now black sees his opportunity and he wants to get his other pieces, which are not doing much. So this is what you should be thinking. If you have time, again, this is all about time, this game, get your pieces to the best squares. And these two pieces I highlighted to me are black's worst pieces because they're the least active. I'd even say the bishop on a8 is a good piece because later on it has a lot of potential. So let's get the worst pieces to better squares. Bishop to f6, trying to get it to the weakened diagonal. Now Danny plays a very passive move, rook b1, not good. And here, bishop to d4 check, king h1, and what is a good move from black now? So imagine you're black. I've got more questions coming your way. So far, a bit of a slow start, but now it's really going to get spicy. So um, is there a way you can either get some... F okay, what you should be looking for when you're building up the pace, you're jogging now. You should notice that your opponent has played bad moves like knight a2, rook b1. All these pieces look really smelly. He's also played f3 which is a weakening move. So you should be feeling more confident. You should be thinking of ways to take advantage of this. And now it's really about creating threats because when you're, when you're running, when you're picking up the pace, you should then be putting more pressure on your opponent. How do you do that? By be creating threats or winning material. So, um, well, Aldo has come up with a very good idea here. Um, and Aldo's idea is to get the last piece into the game. So go rook to c8, very sensible idea because that rook might be able to come round like this even, or it might just be able to pressure on the c-file. So Aldo's idea is a good idea, but can we actually win points here? And Gottlek, I think it's Gottlek was the first person to spot it, black can actually win points here. And so's Fuzzmaster. If you can win points and get away with it, win points. Bishop takes b2. And this is a very crafty way to win a very useful pawn. You've grabbed a pawn, but the point is now this square is a really nasty square. So black, if, if rook takes bishop, queen to f1 is actually checkmate. So we might as well win a pawn. And now the game continued. Bishop d2, uh, sorry, after here. White decides, well, he's got to try to win a pawn. And now, well, the, dight and the knight danced a little bit more. And here, what kind of moves would you be thinking of playing now? So you could try to defend this pawn, but I would say that would be an amateurish mistake because you've got to feel the flow in chess. It's a bit like music, you know, with music, it has a natural flow. When you're playing chess, it should have a natural flow. It should have a natural flow. And what I mean by that is we are now, remember, picking up the pace. We've changed the tempo. White's pieces have all gone backwards. So if we start defending with something like bishop to a3, this is a very negative move. And we've lost some of that initiative we have. We want to keep pushing forwards and we want to free our pieces. So what moves um, would you play here as black? Now, um, a lot of people are suggesting bishop takes e4, but this just seems to lose a piece to me. I, I don't understand that move. Uh, you've got to back up um, these ideas with calculation. Uh, if the queen was on c5 or b6, this might work. But in this position, pawn takes bishop, knight takes, 
Yes, you attack the queen. Yes, you attack the bishop. But you've always got to think of your opponent's best defences. And here, queen to e3 is, it seems to defend everything. And there's no point just giving away a piece or nothing. Okay, you might get some small initiative here. But what's the point of that? I mean, you know, you've got to have a good point to it. Why? 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 Why are you just losing a piece there? I don't understand. There's no reason behind that. And the same goes with knight takes e4. Again, I don't see the point of this. You're, you're taking two points, but you're losing three. I mean, uh, you know, I, I know I know they say chess players are good at maths, but this is not a very hard, hard one to work out. Um, so I wouldn't say that one is the right idea. Don't just give away pieces without thinking. What is a better idea here? What is a better idea? So again, keep the pressure on your opponent. Try to move forwards. Let's see how you guys get on. Okay, Packers, Packers uh, Pack has come up with the right idea. That's in the chess.com chat. Well done, Packers Pat. Really, I, I like the, the move you suggested. Um, I am so I, I think we're going to go with a move and the move that I like the best is a great move because what you're trying to do is create threats, liberate your pieces and increase the pressure. And you do that with a typical move D5. Now, this is a great move because remember what we were saying is if we can get rid of the E pawn, our bishop on A8 becomes better because it's got one less thing in the way and we get rid of a central pawn. And this pawn, watch this pawn. Watch Derek the D-pawn. He is a hero. He's a hero to the end of the life. He wants to be tough. Oh, don't get me singing. Don't get me singing. There was, I think, a, a story of me. Um, well, once a uh, video, I think uh, Fiona, you obviously know Fiona, took a video of me singing Guns N' Roses at karaoke, which was the most embarrassing thing I've ever done, probably. I've actually probably not, but um, uh, I'm actually going to see Guns N' Roses this Saturday. So I, I'm uh, looking forward to that one. That's going to be good. Looking forward to that. But yeah, my, my singing, I, I should just stick to the chess. Don't get me singing. Singing is not good. No, just no singing for me. Chess is the way. Oh, I like that. Blunder Man is saying Danny the D-pawn. Well, I, I would say it's... Well, look what happens. This pawn is basically... Can I say this without being rude? It's going through Danny. Let's just say that. I was going to say up, but then I changed that to through. This pawn is going through Danny. Look at this pawn. Um, okay, right. So uh, the game now continued. Bishop takes b4. And I love what Satovsky does now. Now he starts running because his rook is on pre. So you could move the rook. Yeah, sure. But if you can keep creating threats and keep going forwards and keep attacking, let's do that. And it gets very complicated now. Now, remember, um, your bishop on b2 is not threatened so you because of queen f1 checkmate. So you don't have to worry about the bishop. So what do we do? What does Tosky do? Well, he could move the rook, but instead he just kept on going. He took on e4 and he starts to run. And this is a, a fantastic idea. Um, now, really, white now makes a critical mistake. Um, basically, when you have a bad position, the basic rule is if you've got a bad position and we all get bad positions, what do you do? Well, you try to what I the couple of recommendations I say is defend as actively as you can. The best form of defense is attack. And I found this that basically lower rated players defend too passively. They sit back and they get in a little cage and they get smaller and smaller when they should be striking back. So you should defend actively and strike back if you can. Um, what else should you do when you're defending? Well, it, it basically, if you've got a bad position, and you've got an opportunity to take points, go points up. You might as well be points up with a bad position rather than be have a bad position without being points up. So I think here Danny should have played Bishop takes F8, winning points and threatening checkmate here. Satovsky's idea, and it does get very complicated now, would have been knight back to h5 attacking the queen and then satovsky would take on f3 and you can see this little bishop on a8 gets more and more dangerous so something like queen d6 pawn takes f3 for example something like this and i think black is okay here but at least now if danny doesn't get checkmated he, he's won a rook 
So, you know, this to me, I think would have been a better idea. Instead of that, Danny played c4. Now, why is this a bad idea? Well, after queen f5, would you rather have the queen on f5 or on b5? And this move c4 was a little bit of panic because you forced the black king, the black queen, to a better square. On f5, it's better. It's nearer the white king. So now the game gets really nice. Bishop takes f8. Threatening checkmate here. Knight to h5. Now, I expect in this position that uh, Danny's intention in this position was when he played c4, he wanted to force the queen on b5 away. Because when the queen was on b5, so imagine that queen back on b5, the black queen on this square I'm highlighting was covering b8, but it's not anymore. So I expect Danny's idea here was to play queen to b8. But I think now he realized that black has a fantastic idea and bonus points to anyone who can see the fantastic idea here. And it's black to play in this position. What can black do in this position? Because it looks pretty terrible for black. Black is a rook down. You've lost the rook on f8. And white is threatening checkmate with the bishop. Now, don't just tell me one move. You may have seen the one move, but you need to tell me the follow up. And you need to tell me why, what, you know, you need to tell me more than one move. Seeing one move in a game of chess is completely pointless unless you can follow it up. Um, and, well, I think a lot of you got the right idea here. But again, I, I think here in a game situation, it'd be easy to see because you're kind of nearly even getting a bit desperate as, as black. And you need to look for the most forcing moves first. And as a lot of you are seeing, knight to g3, if you found that move well done, hopefully you had some um, basically uh, idea about what to do next. But this is a fantastic idea. What can white do? Well, let's look, do the process of elimination. He can't move the king because king there allows bishop d4, checkmate. In actual fact, that's a nice checkmate. Um, if we go pawn takes h uh, g3, we have opened up the h file. So when you're in these situations, when the game is running, when the pace has changed, you need to, rather than look at slow maneuvers, you need to look at the most forcing moves. You need to look at checks. You need to look at captures. And here, there's no point looking at anything except for a forcing move because you're so many points down. Look, black is actually a rook and a piece down. But after queen h5 checks, so let's just have a look at the checks. That forces king g1, and now another check, bishop d4, check. Forces king to f1, and now let's bring in the queen. Queen to h1, check. Forces the king to this square, and now queen to g2, check. In an actual fact, this is going to lead to checkmate um, for black. Let's say king d1, queen takes here, check. And eventually we're going to weave a, a checkmate net around the king. Um, and at least we have a draw. So it's uh, so this this was one idea behind it. It's a very very complicated variation, but that's what happens uh, when you uh, when you go for these crazy lines. And the other thing is, what happens if Queen takes G three? Well, what Black has done, if we go back a couple of moves, we had the same position, didn't we? This was the position, but Black has basically just remove that knight from the board it's as if he's just knocked it off the board i always thought that'd be quite a funny thing to have maybe in a game of chess each player has one moment in the game where they can knock one piece off the board you know but it has to be one of their own pieces because after queen b8 we've done well, that's exactly what we've done but the reason we've done that the knight is not on f6 so the bishop on b2 is now defending g7 so here, look at Derek. Go, Derek. Go, go, go. Go, Derek. Go, go, go. Derek, be good. And now we just play pawn takes f3. <coughs> and in actual fact, white is completely lost. Even though white is a rook and a knight up, white's pieces are so badly placed that he is completely lost. There's a threat of queen takes b1 and there's nothing white can do. Let's say white takes another piece. If you're going to go down, you might as well go down uh, in, a, in a blaze of glory. So rook takes b2 
and now it's checkmate so how can black force quite an easy checkmate now um so let's have a look so imagine you're black now it's black to checkmate in two moves here black to checkmate in two moves i'll give you all a chance to try to solve this one and don't just tell me the first move because it's two moves uh, don't guess the first one tell me the two move checkmate here what is the two moves i have to say uh derek the d pawn has not just become gary he's he's actually he's had a very interesting life derek he changed his name to eddie when he took there then he went to freddie and now he's going through gary as well he really is Der derek is on is really on fire um okay well it seems like poker draw has found the checkmate and numerous people on chess.com tv and the checkmate is pawn takes g2 check and whatever happens queen to f1 is checkmate but look how powerful this position this bishop has become this bishop is such a hero i mean look at it it's now the best piece on the board and you only need these three pieces to deliver checkmate it's a beautiful beautiful combination at one um I, I really really like that combination so danny gomali played the best move here after knight h5 he didn't go queen in instead he went queen g4 because he realizes that he needs to try and swap queens very good defensive technique if you're under pressure try to swap queens because your king becomes in less danger now the thing is here of course black just played pawn takes ef3 anyway danny now swap queens and look at derek the d pawn pawn takes g2 check unbelievable that pawn has had such a great journey but he hasn't got many he hasn't got many pieces left black king to g1 and can anyone now tell me the winning combination here i mean do you go do you just go pawn takes queen is that going to be right or is there something even better than pawn takes queen and i think the reason that anand said this was one of his favorite games was because of the finish and the final position is one of the most beautiful and i would say materialistically outnumbered uh, positions you'll ever see it's like a battle where you know uh, what's the famous battle oh, my my brain's gone blank uh, march of the light brigade when, when you have like 50 troops versus 50,000 but the 50 troops win that's what happens in the final position so no one has told me the sequence yet and there is a winning idea um so a lot of you are saying check well that is the obvious move but what you do after queen f2 what you do after queen f2 packers pack is doing very well today well done packers pack you're one of the first people to get this uh so well done packers pack ch3 this is on the chess.com chat congratulations and poker draw you're, you're doing very well today as well sir um and also mark quam i don't know if i said that right the watt 97 look at this and aldo as well look at this beautiful beautiful thing bishop d4 check look at the power of these these are these are like these are like cannons ready to release their balls it sounded a bit funny didn't it be careful not saying that in public um and um there's only one move here queen to f2 only move and now look at this knight to f4 and in this position white resigned even though white is a queen and a rook up and he can even go a queen and a rook and a bishop up there's no good way to stop knight to h3 i mean you will have a look at what happens for example though if black let's have a look at the possibilities here i mean in this position danny actually resigned he could have played on a little bit but he thought it was hopeless um he can't go queen takes knight because the queen is pinned if he goes queen takes bishop knight to h3 i think you agree is this this checkmate which is a once in a lifetime checkmate i mean and the unbelievable thing is this is a modern game between two grandmasters you know it makes it even more unbelievable um and really there's no other good way to stop knight here except for moving the h pawn when your king can try to come to h2 so um i totally agree with john n8 n uh, sorry john h a h s who's saying a very spicy game this is spicy chess h4 is the only move i can see i mean it's, it's just the power of 
these bishops is relentless absolutely relentless it, it, it's something remarkable here um and well i mean uh, someone's asking what are the ratings of the players in this game now let me get this right this is fide rating i think the player the white pieces at the time danny's rating was i think 20 um 560 something like that and the player the black pieces rating is about 2650 so somewhere around there now you could the only way to try it is move the h pawn so you've got an escape square i have to be honest i haven't analyzed this position but i think we can work out this is winning in a couple of ways i would now think of either knight h3 check or even knight e2 check i'm thinking knight e2 is better let's have a look this is all forcing so we can do it the reason i think this is better because i want my um i don't want my knight to be on pre after king h2 king h2 is forced i don't want my knight being attacked and i think now i just take the queen and even though i'm still a rook down worst case scenario i'm going to go g1 queen and i'm going to be two pawns up in the ending because when i queen you're going to have to go rook takes bishop takes uh, g1 check and i will have these four pawns versus your two pawns so i've got all the material back so i think this is this is going to be winning maybe there's even checkmate here i'm actually thinking something like for example um if c5 well i mean i could just take the bishop here of course but if i want to try and checkmate here um what's about this crafty move bishop e4 now let's say you move your rook rook a1 it's checkmate oh no it's not checkmate is it i was trying to go check and checkmate is there not a checkmate here i'm surprised there's no checkmate after c5 uh, i mean this is winning anyway but I i'm surprised there's no checkmate here because all these pieces are very dangerous is there not a checkmate i can't see one because the king runs here you don't need a checkmate the easiest way to win here be king takes bishop and then you go pawn on you know and, and you're winning but anyway i think that's a, a, a fantastic game there i've actually run a well over on what i was trying to do there. i didn't realize i went on for 45 minutes and i probably bored the hell out of all of you there so i, I apologize i apologize for for going on a little bit there um now i will uh, i'm going to try to play a long play game i'm going to have to play quite quickly myself because uh uh because of the time situation so i'm going to try to play a long play game where i can play a game live and i can talk about uh the ideas i'm thinking of now the last time i did this uh, i lost so i, I want to try and not not lose a game I, I really wanted to show you that game i mean when i'm doing these simon says i'm doing another one tomorrow by the way tomorrow is at the same time as today i'm doing another simon says so please please do please do join me tomorrow i mean basically what i'm doing here I, i'm sure if you've got a lesson from a grandmaster they've charged you quite a lot for the same thing it's like you're getting a free lesson other times i play blitz so i do i do a number of things but you know when i see a beautiful game i'm kind of trying to share share some of my love love of uh, chess with you guys you know um because you know it's a beautiful game and you may not have seen seen that and uh you know it is one of those games where um i think it's well well worth well worth people being aware of okay well i'll tell you what um let's i'm going to challenge one of you guys in the chat to a game of 15 minute chess so first of all if you're in uh i'm going to go to the chess.com chat first because you're obviously members there make sure you are on chess.com make sure you're ready to play me the time limit is going to be longer 15 minutes plus 10 seconds move so i can tell you my thoughts and make sure you're please logged on to chess.com and you're ready to accept my challenge when i challenge you and then we'll play a game so um okay and i want to play someone well it's 15 minute chess we're going to play longer time limit um so who wants to play who wants to play and uh, let's uh, see challenge danny wrench i don't think danny would like to play a long play game at this this moment of the of the day who else wants to play okay well i'm having a look tell me you want to play and tell me your handle okay well it's i've got a very low rate it doesn't these things i'm going to play someone lower rated today um than i normally do and everyone when i play people at this they say oh you know this is ridiculous your rating's so low and the person you're playing so low it doesn't matter at all the whole point of this i'm gonna i'm gonna take this challenge on someone's accepting me so that's quite cheeky I'll, i will accept the challenge and the whole point of this long play game 
He's from Norway, so I've got to be a little bit scared. It doesn't matter who I play. Basically, what I'm doing here, you're you're just getting basically the, the, the grandmaster's view. You're you're. This is what a grandmaster thinks like when they're playing chess. And a lot of people, you can probably sort of learn in some ways. Um, you know, you maybe you want to know how grandmaster thinks and learn as you go along. So that's the idea. It doesn't matter if my opponent's low rated. Now my opponent is from Norway, so I'm always a bit scared because the Norwegian players are, are much lower rated. And I'm literally now going to play this longer play game, explain to you exactly what I'm thinking. So as we, we just had a look at Sicilian uh, game, I think it's only fair I also played a Sicilian. And um, we keep it with the theme of, uh, of the game I showed you earlier. I'm also going to show you um, after this game, I've got either another puzzle, a couple of puzzles or, or another embarrassing moment for my life. I showed you one in the past. So my opponent is playing again. He's following the game from earlier. And I'm going to take on D4. And my the, the Sicilian that I generally like playing the most, I, I have played nearly every Sicilian is this one here with g6 now my theory is quite old this is called the dragon sicilian and one of my pet lines this is a line i've written a book on and done a number of dvds on and also if you're if you're a prime member of chess.com i've done five videos on this next move so i hope i don't lose horribly the dragon dwarf is what i've called it and it's kind of a new it's a new opening and the idea of this is that move g6 is the dragon this move here as you saw from the last game is the nyadorf so what happens when a dragon meets a nyadorf they merge together and they become the dragadorf and the point of this is is to get white out of theory but keep the same ideas as you play in the nyadorf and sometimes in the dragon and as we saw in the nyadorf one of the main ideas is b5 because I want to try and maybe start an attack on the queen side later on. And that B pawn is very handy for doing that. And I actually saw someone also said um, um, basically that they wanted me to play the knight, the Dragodorf, so I've played it. Um, so um, basically, yeah, I mean, the idea of my plan, it's very double edged. White should probably castle queen side, which is going to do. Um, Unlike the normal dragon, we've got to think how I'm going to develop my pieces. This is the key thing. I can't get too aggressive before I develop my pieces. And I know that the bishop is best placed here in this opening because like we saw in the last game, remember in the last game how strong that bishop is. It's actually a very similar setup to the game I demonstrated early on. And the bishop here uh, comes to this square, controls the center. Now, you may be thinking, why am I not playing bishop g7 straight away? And the point is, I want to delay bishop g7 because if I play bishop g7 too quickly, my opponent will go bishop h6. Then I'll have to spend another move going bishop takes h6. So I spend two moves going taking that bishop. One of the main plans of my opponent is to go bishop h6 anyway. So why, why not just keep my bishop here? Now, I hope my opponent has actually turned off the commentary. I, I should have said to my opponent to turn off the commentary because otherwise it's a bit like, you know, he's hearing both both views here. Um, if he's watching the stream, I, I don't want to give away my ideas too much, but I'm going to have to anyway. Um, now, again, before I do anything too jiggy, I've got to develop my pieces. Now, I've told you why I'm going to leave that where it is. So the last minor piece you want to get your knights and bishops out is this piece here. Now, where does that knight go and why? What is the best place? Well, I don't think it actually does too much on c6. And my opponent can take on c6. In the Dragodorf, in the Dragodorf, I always put the knight here. This is the setup I go for. Why? Because it means I can keep the c-file open. So if my rook comes, there's no piece in the way, which there would be if I put a knight on c6. And a very standard idea here, which seems really long, but I've used it in a number of games, and it's a very standard idea in the Sicilian. Maybe um, one of the, the one of the most common ideas in the Sicilian, not just this Sicilian, but every, is to get a knight to this square, c4. And I can now think about knight e5, knight here, and later on, even the other knight can come round and get a knight there. Now my opponent's castle kingside. So what that means is I'm now not worried about playing bishop g7 because 
his chances of attacking me of h4 h5 which is a lot scarier when he has a rook on h1 they're not scary anymore so i can develop with bishop g7 now i'm not any more worried about this move bishop h6 in actual fact bishop h6 is a blunder it's very similar to the danny gormani satovsky game remember in the danny gormani satovsky game that the danny played f3 and what did the move f3 weaken if you were paying attention to the first game you would um understand um why f3 what it weakens this is what you do in chess you try to pick up things from lessons and you use them in your own games well f3 if you remember correctly weakened this diagonal so um I hope my opponent's not listening because he might blunder and that would make the game nice and easy and simple. But there's actually a simple idea of me going queen b6. In some positions, if he moves the bishop on e3, uh, then that knight on d4 will probably be lost. So um, generally, what happens in the dragon Sicilian, this is my rule is, uh, well, I think it's not just my rule, it's everyone's rule. If white doesn't castle queenside, so if white doesn't castle queenside, which is clearly the scariest idea for black, black normally gets a good position. For example, I'm going to castle. Positionally speaking, I was taught as a youngster that black has a better pawn structure than white in the Sicilian because I have more pawns in the center with this one. Okay, but let's now think about the next stage of my plan. So my opponent now may be preparing this move again I, i'm not too concerned about that at the moment but can i even do something in the center now a typical idea in the dragon is d5 this is a very good move and again all my ideas here you saw to satovsky play so i'm picking the same ideas so i'm thinking now can i play d5 but i think first of all maybe i even go e5 kick that knight away and then go d5 it's an interesting idea um i could certainly go for that let's just look work that out so e5 knight e2 for example try to follow this in your head d5 trying to free up and then pawn takes d5 knight takes d5 knight takes d5 bishop takes d5 then does he have a move like bishop takes g6 unleashing his queen on my bishop i think he does so i, I don't want to do that so i could go d5 straight away here can't be a bad move but I don't know maybe maybe i just wait with that one another thing i could do is go knight e5 also looks quite tempting um what do i do or do i just let him move the bishop here or do i even prepare for bishop here with you know what i'm going to play a standard idea here because i'm not sure what's right at the moment i'm just going to play rook to e8 now why have i played rook to e8 this is kind of a lazy move i'm actually playing a lazy move here and the idea of doing this is I want to keep my bishop on g7. So I'm not calculating anything too deep. If my opponent plays bishop to h6, I'm going to put my bishop on h8. Then he can't take my rook. Uh, I have to watch out for knight f5. But that doesn't actually do anything, the knight on f5. It's, it's not too scary. Because the, these attacks are not going to scare me when my opponent has put his king on the king side. If he had castle queen side, and if he had a pawn on h4... I'd be a, a lot more afraid, but in this position, this 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 looks quite a, a sensible way to play. So my opponent's also playing sets, which put a rook in the center of the board. I'm going to put my rook on c8. We're both improving our pieces. Put my rook on a half open file, and now if I get my knight into c4, this is a main idea in the Sicilian. My opponent takes. I, I can maybe take with a rook on c4, and and this can't be a bad idea um so um the other thing i could try here i'm still i still like this idea of d5 at some point but i'm not sure if i want to open up the center with d5 or i just play for the c4 square so the c4 square is the other thing i could do i could just try to get a piece into this square and then try to attack my opponent on the queen side which is a normal idea in uh this this kind of opening uh to to do this to attack on the queen side so that, these are the things i'm thinking of but i'm also thinking about what my opponents can do in a in a way i generally when you're playing a lower rated player no offense to my opponent it, it might be magnus carlson in um cigar in, in cigars what's that can't we figure the word this disguise was what i'm thinking of is 
often I, I just play good moves and I wait for them to do something silly, which might sound crazy, but as long as I don't play any bad moves, then how, how am I going to lose a game? And that could even be the first mistake my opponents played. Earlier on, I did say whenever your opponent plays a poor move, it weakens a square. Now, what square has that weakened? It's weakened G3. And I'm already now thinking of, of ideas, potentially, of trying to get my knight into G3. My opponent has created a little weakness of me that I don't think he wanted to create. Uh, clearly, he's trying to push his pawn here, but I'm not so worried about that. So if I do go knight H5, my opponent could maybe play a king to this square. And then can I come in with a check? f4 knight takes f4 rook takes g5 some tactics here tactics here could be working now i don't know this also could be a little bit artificial knight here because then he might play queen f2 my knight is not going to be very good there but i might i might just wait with that actually because it's quite an easy threat for my opponent to stop my knight coming here it's a little bit superficial and again you know if it works well it works well but i think if i do go there queen f2 I don't think my knight is very, very well positioned there. So it's a little bit artificial, I feel. So, okay, so I'm, I'm going to keep that in mind, though. Keep it in mind. Now, other things I could do, try to get this knight to that square. Can't be a bad idea. So I could go knight here. Let's say f4, knight here, bishop takes, rook takes. And then if he goes pawn here, then... Well, then I have this knight coming over to this square. I could go... I could go knight b6 as well. Um, knight b6 is another idea. Knight c5. I'm trying to work out which is the best square. Knight c5 reminds me of an Avantrick game. I might go for this one. And the idea behind that will be, do I really want to swap this bishop off? I'm just thinking if I do. Well, I'm thinking knight c5 followed by e5 and d5. Really trying to open up the center. So I'm just going to calculate some lines there. Knight c5, and if I get e5 in, knight e2, get d5 in. Uh, I don't like all these pieces lined up against me here. So I don't know, I think I'm going to wait a little bit for that. Now, what about also, uh, what about just a move that improves my position without committing too much? Well, I'm also thinking about queen c7, because then the queen's on a useful diagonal, and it seems to get out the way of the rook and if my opponent if the queen c7 goes here i can go knight c5 and e4 is weak i like that move it just improves my position a little bit so i'm gonna go queen c7 because my opponent just played a move which i consider a slight weakness so I'm not going to commit to a plan. I'm just going to see if I can improve things. And the queen must be better here because I've got off any nasty idea there. Um, and um, I'm basically just in some point now when my knight comes to h5, I might have d5. And you can see my queen is going to be released along that diagonal. So this seems to improve my position a little bit without... Um, basically doing anything serious giving my opponent a chance to go wrong another idea i quite like is putting the queen on a8 in these kind of positions this is a, a, a an idea of the old uh, master retty retty used to put his uh, um queen on a8 because you know this increases this diagonal so when you actually do open things up with e5 and d5 I have this fantastic diagonal but i think this is the, also a case of the threat of me playing e5 and d5 is maybe even stronger than the execution why why am i i don't need to rush to play these moves i might as well wait until the best opportunity if my opponent is not doing much okay so my opponent's played the queen here that's probably a good move and he's trying to get his queen to a better square i think that's a good move good move so now I've got a couple of things I consider. I think it's time to move this knight. Let's move this knight. Um, now, I think I want to get it into the normal square, like so often in the Sicilian. I'm going to move it to this square here, e5, because as I said earlier on, this knight wants to come to c4. Now, my opponent might play f4, 
and um, and i'm hoping f4 looks aggressive but it does have the downside of weakening this square here f4 does weaken e4 and I, he's also got to think can i go knight g4 so if f4 knight g4 is is a tactic pawn takes g4 knight takes g4 queen moves knight takes e3 queen takes e3 and then even there i mean this is quite unclear because i have queen c5 threatening to win this one and that might be that might be a tactic that actually works for me if you followed um that uh that that sequence of events there so i will wait i'm not going to spend too much energy uh, to to uh to to you know calculate so i'm going to i'm only going to analyze it if my opponent moves but if he goes f4 i might be able to play knight g4 if my opponent does nothing here i'm going to put my knight on probably well this is the main square in the sicilian you should know your middle game plans in the sicilian when you play the sicilian this knight here which i'm going to throw around the board nearly always dreams of getting to c4 because then white has to exchange off my queen comes into the position and i've got rid of a very good piece of his the bishop here i say it's a good piece it's quite an annoying piece because it defends this this pawn here and it's quite a solid solid piece so i'm thinking here knight c4 is going to be one of my next moves just to improve my position a little bit um and maybe after i have my knight on c4 then i'm really going to consider these two moves because i'm feeling that when i play the pawn break d5 so my opponent's played this so tactically i've got to try to work this out now um and this is okay knight g4 knight g4 takes so I, i'm i'm just gonna knight g4 takes knight takes queen e f3 knight takes e3 queen takes e3 and then this knight is defended by the queen but if i play queen to c5 i threaten that knight it looks a bit risky this way of playing i don't necessarily need to play like this knight e2 then e5 but i'm opening myself up on the f file okay if he goes after queen c5 e5 pawn takes e5 pawn takes e5 bishop takes e5 and then what about queen back to f2 again this is a risky way to play it might be okay it might be an okay way to play but it looks quite risky but do do i do i have to play it now because if knight c4 takes queen takes it goes e5 anyway well i don't know how scared i am of that one uh with my knight coming here the other thing is i could go knight takes d3 straight away um and then play something like e5 knight takes d3 e5 but i don't know okay i'm going to look at knight g4 one more time because if it works it's good knight g4 takes takes take here takes queen takes and then i play queen c5 with knight e2 e5 for example pawn takes e5 pawn takes e5 knight f5 it gets very complicated then i don't, I don't know it's very risky i, I mean it's t i've taken a lot of risks so take 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 takes here and if pawn here takes takes bishop takes queen f2 i think i'm i think i think it i think it works so i might just play it i think it works so i might just play it but i i, I just really when you're playing something as complicated as this then it, it could just be it could be bad and i might i might you know i don't i don't really want to lose this game i've done i've done that before knight here takes 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 take take here knight here e5 takes takes if knight f5 take here can i defend that position i'd be pretty confident he's going to come down here oh hang on a minute so queen here e5 so i'm just doing through this uh, knight here i've seen i've seen as a problem in my calculations takes takes queen here and if i take here check king here queen takes b7 i don't like it so much so I, I, i'm just going to play i'm going to play this one i mean i couldn't get i couldn't get that one to work i didn't want to take on d3 because then my opponent would play pawn takes d3 and it, 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 i've improved his pawn structure because as i've said the main weakness is e4 here 
and if I if I play um, knight takes d3 then his pawns defend each other now after the game I'll have a look at knight takes g4 and I'll tell you what I, I was worried about if I if I had more time or if I wasn't talking so much then I may have played it if I calculate it was okay but it's very risky this way is a lot safer now um my opponent I'm not gonna I don't really want to give my opponent hints but I, I'm mainly calculating if he takes here but the problem then is how does he defend e4 so if he takes here I might even take with my pawn because then his e4 pawn seems to be very hard to defend and that way I keep my queen on c7 so I keep controlling e5 because what I'm worried about um, is basically if he takes here and I go queen takes he may play e5 and that looks quite risky for me pawn takes e5 pawn takes e5 and he has this pressure against f7 so if, if bishop takes queen takes e5 I'd have to move my king it's probably okay, not the end of the world for me, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to allow that. Why Why should I allow that? So if he takes on c4, I think pawn takes his best. And then the idea is if e5, I go pawn takes, pawn takes, queen takes e5, because I keep my queen on c7. And I'm just going to double check there. It looks like a pawn to me. I'm quite, I'm quite happy with that position because my knight there cannot be budged and he can't break through and another downside of my opponent doing this e5 move so i'm going to play it. i'm not going to think too much is that my bishop obviously becomes very strong if he moves that pawn that bishop becomes a very very strong uh piece basically um so this is the idea of it uh so i actually see uh um basically uh, a lot of people saying why do i wait so long at start i have to say actually doing doing this uh, and speaking it might seem easy but even, even though i've got 15 minutes i always get a bit short of time because i'm trying to explain all my ideas i'm not thinking as much as i would do normally and it is it's a lot harder than a lot harder than you would expect maybe just for me because i'm stupid i'm stupidgm.com um, but you get the idea right so so this is the point i'm trying to attack this square i think if he pushes i just win that pawn now if he goes queen to this square queen to f3 then i might go for retty's idea remember retty's idea which is queen a8 and increase the pressure on this square so this is a normal idea but again you have to know about these ideas in, in order to um in, in order to you know you have to have seen them in the past in order to recognize them in your own games that's why it's so important to study the games of players from the old days because you get to know their ideas and okay so here i really like the idea of putting my queen on this square increasing the pressure against this uh this one now other ideas i have i've got like well e5 seems very risky because i open up this file uh but it is interesting so if i go e5 takes i can go rook takes e5 and that does open things up so i'm going to look at this Ta here takes rook takes e5 and this is really really in, in trouble then um quite tempted to do that because my queen does defend this one so e5 takes rook takes bishop g5 can't be played can he defend that pawn bishop f4 well if he goes bishop f4 i'll be tempted to sacrifice then surely um again it's risky opening up the position when i don't need to the other idea is just to put this queen on a8 so should we go for the sensible idea put the queen on a8 um do we go e5 which one okay you know what i think i'm going to go for e5 i think i think it's time to open up the position a little bit this is quite risky i'm not even sure i'm better here um but when you've got two bishops and of course i do have the advantage of the two bishops here you generally want to open up the position to get those um bishops into the game and you can see now my rook is trying to increase the pressure against e4 so this is the idea i'm just going to try to take on e4 but it's a double-edged move because my opponent has the f file and i'm just literally saying open me up on the f file so it could it could basically backfire against me uh, which i hope it doesn't God, i've got a lot of rating points to lose here uh, <laughs> but we'll see we'll see my opponent playing a lot 
a lot stronger than his rating uh, at this moment in time. Do you like that? I'm already getting ready for a back out course just in case a disaster happens. So, okay, so I think the critical line is my opponent takes on e5, rook takes bishop f4. When I can sacrifice, that's what I want to do. I want to play rook takes e4. Instead, my opponent is going slightly passive here, but he is aiming for counterplay. And now this surely is dropping. Surely now I can I can get through. So I've got a lot of tempting moves here. I can even consider knight takes e4 and f5. But simple is best if it works. So can I just go pawn takes and knight takes e4. My queen does defend f7. So I'm going to look at that. Takes, bishop takes here, takes. I like this. My bishops are coming to life. I think this bishop on b7 could be a winner. It could be a winner. So I don't see any reason why I shouldn't keep things simple. So simple is good. I mean, if you've got a possibility of two, two things which look good, why not go for the simplest? Because just keep it simple. And, and the point of this is, well, I'm opening up my rook. So I'm now going to grab this one. And my bishop now has this fantastic diagonal as well. And it looks like I have kind of picked up a pawn, but things could get a little bit complicated if he goes knight takes, bishop takes, bishop takes d6. So then I take on f3. That doesn't work for him because my rook is actually very well placed here. This e5 move has worked exceptionally well. I think my opponent's knight e2 was the main mistake. This this mistake, knight e2, seems to have let my opponent's position kind of crumble a little bit. But okay, you still have to win one position. And this is even, even you know, grandmasters have to do this. And everything's worked well. I mean, it's, it's funny how similar it is to the gormali satovsky game. When Satovsky, remember his bishop opened up, it really became the best piece in the whole position. And this could, well, maybe be what's what's going on here who knows so i'm just going to try to open this guy up and get towards his king now i think after this we've run a bit out of time for the show today so i'm probably going to call it a day but i will look at the game so get your suggestions in and we'll have a look at where maybe i could have tried something else this knight g4 move was very interesting um do remember that um i'm basically on again tomorrow on this on, i think on the same place i might stream from my own twitch channel and uh, not so clear yet um who knows so we could do that but i'm going to be on at the same time tomorrow and i don't know what i'll do tomorrow it's friday i might have to do some friday friday feeling stuff i don't know maybe get some whoa what happened there what happened there that's not good that's not my game okay anyway okay that, that was one of the puzzles i had set up right now uh, to be honest uh rook takes may be okay but I'm going to attack the queen because I like queens. I like queens. Queens are fun. Queens, queens are queens are for me. And look at that beast. That is a beast. That's a raking beast there. And I mean, such a strong bishop. And in an open position where there's lots of open lines, do do do. The bishop is a fantastic piece. And and that little guy there, that bishop is is brilliant. And I might now, well, I've got a couple of ideas here. Um, I could go very cheeky here. I could do the very cheeky move. Queen here, getting ready to come over there. Ooh. <laughs> I could do that. Or I could um, play bishop takes c2. I've got too many bloody good moves. But if I do that, I don't want to allow any counterplay. You know, when you've got a better position, why allow counterplay? Don't don't grab you know don't allow any counterplay it's silly to do that another thing i could do is go queen b7 threatening to simplify with bishop takes g2 and i like that move this one's a bit artificial i think putting the queen on this square because just king h2 i don't think my queen is very well placed there i like my queen on uh well i'd like it on this square if i go there though, the only move he could play is knight c3 so is there anything even better in this position queen d7 king h2 well i suppose no nah, i could go d5 no nah, i'm just gonna i'm gonna stick with this one i'm gonna stick with this i'm gonna have to move a little bit uh a little bit quicker now so i'm just gonna go for this move and i have a couple of threats here this one potentially this one here as well um 
I think my opponent has to play knight to c3. And in that position, I can either try to hold on to my extra pawn with d5. My queen on b7 is a very good piece, defending f7. It does a good job there. And I think as long as I keep control here, it's a pawn up. And a pawn is normally enough to win. So he, he has played the right move and he's played it quickly. I won't recommend any more moves just in case he's listening. Blooming fly here as well. It's getting really hot in England now. Go away, fly. And that kind of stops. That stops a lot of my tricks. Um, but I still like my position. Let's let's just play sensible. That was a weak pawn. So let's move my weak pawn. You know, very sensible chess. And the other thing is, I, I kept talking about the bishop on e4 being a good piece. But I have to say, this little guy here, which is the dragon bishop. This is a famous uh, piece in the dragon is pretty stonking as well. I mean, it, it cuts across the board, hitting this weak pawn. And, uh, well, I have, I mean, I think I'm just gonna go rook takes because I wanna keep the open file here. Pawn takes is also okay, but I wanna, I wanna keep my control. And if I take with a rook here, you know, taking with the pawn would block my rook in. So this way, well, I keep control of the position. So I'm gonna go rook here, Fret and rookie too, and this this seems to this seems to be going pretty well, doesn't it, for me? Um, and my opponent stopped all the frets, but another thing he has to be a little bit concerned about now, if he ever gets to an ending, and these are the kind of things again you've got to be thinking of. Even if I was not a pawn up here, let's imagine um, I you know let's imagine I wasn't a pawn up, then any ending now where let's imagine we could take off all the pieces I'm going to highlight. So let's imagine you remove all of these pieces from the board and you leave yourself just with the two bishops. Well, it must be winning for me because any ending is going to be very good because the pawns I'm highlighting here are all on dark squares so I can potentially attack them. My opponent can't attack my pawns on light squares. But he's found the best move because he can't allow my rook to come in to, to this square. So what should I do here? Well, I wanna take control of the open file, just play simple chess. So my first fault is queen to e7, and then if he takes, queen takes e4. This is my first fault, just keeping control of the position. Um, now, if I take on e1, it's okay, but queen endings are, are, are quite tricky. So I don't need to rush into that ending. So I think, I think this this makes the most sense. Just keep control of the open line. Keep control of the open line for now. Um, even though I'm a pawn up, I want to have the other uh, things. I want to keep, you know, I, I want to have as many trumps as I can because a, a pawn up, like I said, is normally enough to win the game, but only because it gives you extra control when you get to an ending. But more importantly are the other factors in this position. So I'm not going to recommend moves to my opponent, even though I know exactly what I think my opponent should do in this position. Um, but I'm not going to say it because I don't want to give it away. Um, and most importantly for me, though, I I'm, I'm thinking about endings and how I can improve my position here. Maybe I want to play d4 at the right moment to open up my bishop towards b2. Um, OK, so my opponent has come, but he's not actually threatening anything. He's not threatening to take there because his bishop is on pre. So that move, I think, is is probably a small error. But let's not be too critical of, 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 of White here because he's played very good games so far for his rating. He's played well above his rating. OK, so I don't think d4 is the way to play. Uh, I could try to put my pawn on a4, just improve my position a little bit. You never know, that pawn could be quite nice later on. Or I could maybe play a move like h5, why? Because it gives my king an escape square, could be very useful in tactics. So I think I'm just going to do that. I don't need to rush. And with this one, I just give my king an escape square on h7. So it can tuck itself away on that square on on h7 if if it needs to so again i'm not going to do anything particularly crazy in this game i just want to keep things sensible my king on h7 is a bit safer and my opponent doesn't at the moment i believe have any good active moves maybe maybe my opponent could try moving his bishop 
uh, and then threatening that pawn. But then, he, then he's going to have problems with the back rank. So even that doesn't look um, uh, so, so good. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's quite funny, this time limit. I mean, I guess at Blitz Chess on um, chess.com, I mean, my rating in Blitz normally goes between 2,400 and 2,600. It's somewhere around there. But at this at this limit, obviously, as you can see, my rating is a lot lower. OK, hang on a minute. Let's, let's just make sure we, 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 we cover this one. And again, he's played another good move. He's not giving in easily at all. That's a very good move because... Now he's also threatening rook here would win the game. I, I missed that one. So can I go queen e3? Try to get the queens off the board. That looks like the best option to me. Let's again, when you're material up, you aim for the endings, you aim for exchanges generally. And here, if I exchange queens, like I mentioned, the ending is going to be horrible for him if the queens come off because my bishop later on will have very good chances to win a pawn over there. Um, so this move also attacks his bishop, and I think now I'm going to get the queens off the board, which will make the conversion of this um, of this win uh, a lot easier. Uh, okay, so now I can take the queens off straight away, um, and I expect that's what I'm going to do. Um, I don't see any other options. So let, let's get the queens off the board, and now how do I deal with this pawn? Well, I could try to play it slowly and just try to again this pawn go for that one i don't want to give up the open file particularly that that easy the other thing to do is just try to defend this one with something like rook here so i keep the file but then bishop here what well, i have the check then i'm going to play i'm going to play rook to this square because i have the open file why why give away the open file my next plan will be as in any ending to bring my king to the center if I put my king on e6, the pawn on d5 is well defended, then my rook will be able to activate itself. Always look where you have a pawn majority in endings, and in this position I have a pawn majority 3 versus 2 on the king side, and you should often play if you have time where your pawn majority is. So in this position, I'm going to play maybe with my three pawns, but he has put the bishop here. Now, this allows me to go into a, to swap the bishops off but also maybe i wanted to get my bishop to this square that would be nice but his bishop on d4 would then be a very strong piece so i might just go for a pure rook ending which i think is going to be winning technically because again even though it, the ending might be better than some of the other endings he's had the pawn on b2 is such a weak pawn this is one problem he's got but the other problem he's got is that my rook controls the open file so i think um you know both of these factors should give me a winning position if i can just move well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna defend my pawn i want to bring my king in the other thing i'm looking at does my opponent have any counterplay and i think the answer is no because he can't move his pawns uh, he's a little bit stuck for moves so this seems to be like a, a good way to try and convert uh, my advantage now, what, what's he trying to do? King there, I can always go f6. Now, there was one move in that last position I was a little bit worried about. Actually, I didn't want to say it, but I thought he might be able to go b3, and then if takes rook b4, which I didn't really want to allow. I didn't really want him to play. So, if I can stop that now, I certainly will. And I think I can by improving my position. So, I'm going to go here first, because now if he goes b3, I can take. And I've taken away rook b4. When you're trying to draw a rook and pawn ending, what you should be trying to do is swap off pawns. Swap off pawns. The more pawns you swap off, the less pawns on the board, the nearer to a draw. And if he could have got rid of his one weakness, that would have helped his defensive chances. Um, now, I could have gone rook e2, as some people are recommended, but I, I don't want to swap off pawns. Then he would take here. I don't need to rush that move. So my next step um is well he's gonna go g4 maybe i bring my king in can i stop g4 well g5 is very tempting actually then i can go pawn here i like g5 it gains some more squares it stops his king and also then if my opponent does play g4 i can play h4 and i've left him with a weakness on h3 another weakness that later on i think he he could struggle defending okay well now 
I, I, I have two options again. Do I move my king yet or do I actually even play this move? F4. So my opponent here, he wants to play H4. And I think I'm going to need the move F6. So it's time to bring my king. Let's bring the king into the middle of the game. As soon as my king gets this square, my rook is free to move because my king will be guarding uh, this pawn. So um, my opponent now maybe could try h4. And then I have to consider a couple of ideas. Do I go check or do I go check with the rook even? Do I move my rook to what could be a better square in, in that position? Okay, so he's gone h4. He's given me this possibility of checking. Now, I don't think I want to allow his king to come across. In actual fact, I think I'm just going to go f6. This is one of the reasons I didn't push my pawn here. As I said, when you have a majority of pawns, sometimes then it doesn't matter if the pawns get exchanged because later on you'll get a pass pawn. I have two pawns versus one. So later on I can play h4 and that'll be a pass pawn. But before I do any of that, I've got to start I've got to start using my king. Now my opponent's defending very well. All credit to my opponent. He's now trying to activate his rook. So I'm going to push my king into the position. And of course, he is a little bit short of time. Um, now that's a move I missed, I'll be honest, but it shouldn't be too bad because I always got g4. Now, could I, is he threatening to take there? Do I go g4 anyway? There's just some little tactics there. King and pawn ending. No, I don't need to risk that. I'm just going to go, I'm going to push on. So he's finding some good ideas, but he has to be very careful here. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give anything away. I think that's a major mistake, major mistake. Because now, after this move, can he stop checkmate? Oh dear. Oh dear. He's put himself into a checkmate position. Can he actually stop rook to e4 checkmate? Ooh, ooh. Uh oh. No, he can't. Okay. So there we go. All right. Well, you know, I think the rook ending was always quite good for me. My opponent, of course, blundered. And that's the thing is, it's much harder to defend than it is to uh, attack now let's just have a look at the important moments of that game before we end the show and like i said if you want to know more about this opening i'm going to have to do a little sales pitch now and again guys you know if you don't like my sales pitches put your put your fingers in your ears and just swear at me now um but if you want to learn more about this uh opening um i would say the best thing i've done is i've done a dvd you can buy from gingergm.com and it's the it's called the killer dragon part two and in that one i talk about um i talk about this setup with g6 and a6 which is really interesting now my opponent gave me a very easy opening by castling kingside as soon as this happens black should always be okay uh, but i just wanted to check this one tactical thing that i was talking about later on and the tactical thing i was talking about was around this moment here now I had the um, choice of going knight c4. By the way, if you are going to tune off now, do remember there's a show tomorrow, same time with me. I might even do it on my uh, Twitch, but it will probably be on chess. It is on chess.com uh, TV. So please join me then, and we'll try to do a bit of education and have a bit of fun as well. That's, that's the most important thing in chess, isn't it? You know, do something educational, but also enjoy it at the same time. If you do want to support me, go and buy that DVD. You won't regret it. Um, Okay, so um, yeah, go on, go go there now, go and buy it now. Go to gingergm slash shop, buy the digital download. Come on, I'll give you a money back guarantee. How about that? You can support the show by doing it. <laughs> okay, well here, the way the game went seemed okay. And I think my opponent's last chance was here. He moved his knight back, but now he lost the pawn and he lost the game. So I think what my opponent had to do um after this move was take on e5 but he did play very well for his rating um he did play very very well for his rating um and then this was what i was thinking my opponent's best chance was to do this Let's try some start some counter attack along this diagonal and here i was actually quite tempted to do a little sacrifice now but i don't know if it's sound i was thinking about this one Knight takes here, so I sacrifice the exchange just to open up my bishops. 
and I don't know, this is what I was thinking about playing, but of course it's a risky way to play. It's probably okay, but I don't know. I mean, my knight is very good as well on this square, but my opponent had to play that. But maybe the real critical try was earlier on. There's so many flies around today. It's so hot in, in England, which is good. I'm not complaining, but maybe the critical, critical thing here was this move. Now, this is what I wanted to play, but I turned it down because... I'll, sh I'll tell you what I was calculating now. The thing I was calculating in, in this position, some people are saying it's Chris Ward's book on the dragon. Yeah, Chris Ward's book on the dragon is very good, but it's a bit dated and he doesn't cover this system on the dragon. You know, go kill a, kill a, kill a dragon part two, eight ninety nine, five five hours of tuition. You've got to get it, guys. You've got to get it. Um, but here, this, this move... The reason I didn't play it, I thought he would take. So it's a it's a, a mini piece sacrifice. I thought he'd do something like this. And the idea of this sacrifice is obviously not to lose a piece, but it's to play queen here. When I'm trying to take advantage of his pinned knight on e5. And my next idea is to play pawn to e5 and win my piece back. Now, the reason I did not play this is I didn't like the line bishop e2 so he's now defending this with two pieces and he's also stopping maybe any checks with my queen I have to now play pawn to e5 and this looks very good for me because he can't really move his knight because I will take his queen and if he moves his knight to this square I'll just take the knight that's got to be good I get my piece back with a, a number of pawns but the reason I turned this down is I thought he could take here now and if I want to get my piece back I have to play pawn takes here and now I thought he could move his queen to this square and this is why I, I, I didn't do this but the more I'm thinking about this I've just realized that I did a little miscalculation I stopped my analysis at pawn takes d4 check king here queen takes b7 but you know what I forgot here very simply, I forgot that I could go pawn takes c3, and this should now be a winning position because I say that he, he gets quite active with his rook, so rook d7 should be winning. Queen e5, rook f7, bit complicated, but now maybe I go pawn takes b2. Oh, like the Satoshi game, look at that pawn go. Look at that pawn go. So maybe that was the idea, but in the end, I couldn't work it out. If you're in a game situation like that yourselves, you might as well pick the simple option if you think it gives you a good position anyway. And that's what I did. But all credit to my opponent for playing a good game. Right, guys. Well, I've run out of time now. Um, let me just check if there's any shows after me if you're on chess.com. I haven't actually checked the schedule after me. Um, and there is indeed the one and only Danny Wrench. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So if you stay tuned for... Uh, it will come back in 25 minutes. Danny Wrench is doing some playing some blitz chess, which would be loads of fun. So do come back to that. And remember, I'm going to be here uh, tomorrow at the same time with the same quarter, same sort of stuff, which I hope you enjoy. The starting time tomorrow is 9 p.m. British summer time, which is 1 p.m. your time in America, whatever that is, depending where you are. But I'm sure you can work it out. It's about an hour and a half ago from now tomorrow, wherever you are in the world. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for tuning into the show. You know, obviously you guys make the show. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do this if you weren't watching. Simple as that. But you get a nice free lesson, hopefully, and a bit of enjoyment. So thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you tomorrow. And go and buy the DVD. Go and buy the Killer Dragon. Money back guarantee. You won't regret it. You can download it. You don't need a DVD player. Download it to your... You can even get it on your iPad. You know, you can look at it on your iPad when you're on the train. Just before you go 